In the last chapter of RK Motors' Legend of Le Mans, we deconstructed the pieces involved in Ford's domination of Ferrari at Le Mans. With the help of Mark Allen and the team at Rare Drive, we answered the question, how do you dismantle a legend? In this chapter of Legend of Le Mans, we'll dissect the titan of technology that is the venerable GT40 Mark II of yesteryear. The team at Rare Drive will take us deeper into the technology employed by Ford and Shelby American to secure the win, not only for Ford, but for America. Let's take a look at the GT40, chassis number 1046, as well as the runner-ups in the 66 Le Mans to see how they stack up. Ford's effort to win at Le Mans became known as Ford Total Performance, in which they spent three years of effort and budgets totaling $3 million to dominate the motorsports arena in 1966. Ferrari's prototype class match to the GT40 was the 330P3. The 330P3 was an impressive performer on paper, weighing in at only 1,600 pounds and was powered by a 4-liter V12 producing 420 horsepower. This made for an astonishing power-to-weight ratio of 0.263 horsepower per pound. Now these specifications bested that of the GT40, but Le Mans was not conceived to bow out to bench racing. The Ferrari prototypes exited the race at laps 123 and 226, neither making it past the 17th hour. The third placing manufacturer of the 66 Le Mans was Ferrari, whose 275 GTBC finished eighth overall. The Ferrari was the second heaviest car out of the top three manufacturers, weighing in at around 2,500 pounds, but sported a V12 engine producing 290 horsepower and 188 pound-feet of torque giving the 275 a power to weight ratio of 0.118 horsepower per pound. The second placing manufacturer was Porsche, with its 906 long tail finishing fourth. The Porsche was the lightest of the top placing cars with a 1300 pound weight and featured a two liter flat six pumping out 225 horsepower and 145 pound feet of torque. The Porsche had a much better power to weight ratio than that of the Ferrari, with 0.165 horsepower per pound. As for the GT40, the dominant factor behind its performance becomes readily apparent, sheer power. The Ford weighed in at around 2,600 pounds with no less than 485 horsepower and 475 pound-feet of torque, being ringed out of a 7 liter 427 cubic inch V8. That helped provide the GT40 the best power to weight ratio of the three at 0.180 horsepower per pound, despite being the heaviest of the lot. The GT40 also had the highest top speed out of the three at an astounding 215 mile per hour, versus that of the Porsche at 175 mile per hour and the Ferrari at 171 mile per hour. For total performance indeed. With any race, it rarely comes down to performance numbers, but rather a myriad of factors. That's where the experts at Rare Drive come in to discuss key components of the chassis, aero, and engine that helped solidify Ford's engineering will to win the 1966 Le Mans. The story goes, Ford's 289 was originally intended to power the manufacturer commissioned GT40s in the 1966 Le Mans, but just months before the race, a decision was made to implement Ford's new 427 FE V8. One of the things that they tried, like Shelby always did, was how do we make it faster? How do we make it faster? How do we make it more reliable? And so they experimented in 65 with a 427 engine in the GT40. But for the 66 season, they decided to go full steam ahead with the big block program. So what they did was they ordered several cars in batches of two or three from Ford Advanced Vehicles in the UK. And they sent over rolling chassis, basically like this, what you're seeing here. And then they would begin the process of converting it to fit the 427 and to address any of their perceived shortcomings of the original design. In addition to variances in the monocoque chassis to support the big block, various suspension and brake bits needed to be bolstered to accommodate the added power and speed. One of the things that they did was the competition small block cars had a quick release brake pad mechanism so that you could change the pads during a race without having to get tools out. And so on the small block GT40s, they have a piece like this that connects between two bolts like that. And there's a spring inside this and you squeeze it and you take it off and you take the pads out, you put the pads back and you put that back on. But Shelby's concern was that this would get lost. I mean, it's off, it's a loose piece that you can put down on the ground. It's nighttime, it's raining maybe during a race. You don't want to be searching around for that and wasting time. So they took and redesigned that system. So what they did was they put a hinge on it and they relocated the, the lower bolt hole and put this hinge on. So now 
when you want to use this, you just squeeze it, hinge it out of the way, put the new pads in, hinge it back down, it doesn't get lost. The rugged chassis was complemented by a flowing exterior design, including such subtle improvements like the 1966 car's nose being reworked for better aerodynamics with the added benefit of a shorter profile saving 19 pounds in weight. This tail was on the car at Le Mans when it won. And so this is a significant piece of the car. Uh, it, it better part of half the bodywork. And so uh, we documented that it was the original tail by photographs, period photographs, and details on the car that, that correspond with details on the chassis. This, these tails are incredibly light compared to a, a small block Mark I GT40. It has very thick, heavy fiberglass. And one of the things that Shelby didn't like was that the fiberglass was so heavy. He didn't see any sense to it. So he, he made his fiberglass much, much thinner. And so this fiberglass, as you can see, is, is nothing. I mean, it's just, just made of tissue paper, basically. And so when you look at pictures of the car at Le Mans, you can see that this whole tail is caved in from just air force coming over it and gravity. Fortunately, it was in very good shape. It had had some work to it over its life and some parts cut out of it and a little bit of damage here and there. And of course, a lot of damage from the Le Mans race. You can see all the star marks from rocks kicking up and chipping it. With these engines, they hit exactly the right combination of durability versus performance. They had enough performance to outrun all the other cars and run 210 miles an hour, which was the fastest anybody had ever run at that track. It was a very simple car to drive, and I think that is all what helped lead to its success. An old saying begins to resonate as we unravel the performance characteristics of the 66 GT40 Mark IIs. Horsepower sells cars, torque wins races. A turn of phrase often attributed to Enzo Ferrari, and whether true or not, we find it ironically fitting in the case of the 1966 Le Mans, where raw horsepower and torque outpowered the prancing horse from Marinello. It became suddenly evident that Ford's time and money was not wasted in their mission to win at Le Mans. Secured due to the thoughtful engineering of each aspect of the GT40, from its aero and chassis to the powerful 427, producing a well-balanced and properly measured machine. As we continue on with the legend of Le Mans, stay tuned for the fourth chapter in the series as we dive deeper into what it actually takes to restore a vintage race car of such renown, down to sourcing the correct bolts for a pristine and truly authentic restoration.